Federal court judges in Texas just cannot stand the idea that you can get an abortion pill by mail. Hey friends, Dr. Abdul, I'll say it here. Before I go on, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the little bell so you never miss our content. So way back in April, a federal court judge appointed by Donald Trump, who is an avowed enemy of reproductive freedom, made one of the wildest decisions of 2023, and that is saying a lot. He ruled that the FDA's approval of mifepristone, one of two drugs that's used in medication abortions, well, that that FDA approval was bunk. It didn't follow correct science. And he used some really off the wall reasoning to suggest that. He was literally citing blog posts from like the nether regions of the internet to argue why the FDA's ruling in 2000, the year 2000, 23 years ago, should never have taken place. The precedent here is awful. In the first place, taking away medication abortion from women all over the country by one man in Texas is a real problem. This follows, of course, on the back of the Supreme Court decision to undo reproductive freedom. But there's a curious thing about that. Samuel Alito, who wrote the decision on behalf of the majority, who did away with Roe, a 50-year precedent to protect reproductive freedoms and enshrine them in the Constitution. Yeah, when he wrote that, he argued that they were sending this back to elected representatives, specifically to the states. Now, in the ensuing year, you have a federal court judge in Texas who is banning access to medication abortions for the entire country. Now, that seems to, mm, I don't know, not really follow the reasoning that Alito justified. Well, that's not surprising because all that tells you is that this was never about legal reasoning. The only thing that these judges seem to care about is having a fig leaf on a singular opinion. They don't really quite care if another judge comes out and opposes that exact reasoning, which is exactly what Kaz Merrick did. Now, on its face, taking away medication abortion from millions of women, particularly when you've got nearly half the states that have moved to ban procedural abortions, you appreciate how dire that is. But then there's another piece to this. How is it that you have a single person who can remand the decisions of an entire agency whose responsibility it is to make these decisions? You appreciate the really, really problematic precedent here. It frankly puts ideology over science and just about anything else when it comes to government decision-making about medications. For now, access to mifepristone is still safe. And that's because the Supreme Court moved to stay that decision pending a decision about whether or not the court would actually hear an appeal from the Biden administration. Meanwhile, though, the case was taken to an appeals court, a group of three judges who tried to find some, I don't know, middle of the road approach to this. They made the decision that Judge Kaczmarek's approach to literally undoing the FDA's approval was a little much. But instead, they decided to put all kinds of restrictions around access to mifepristone, that you had to go see a doctor, that you couldn't receive it by mail. Now, that's a real problem for people who need these medications living in states that have already banned abortion. Just last week, that appeals panel reaffirmed their position on this. But pending the Supreme Court, we're all just holding our breaths. I want to unpack a couple of aspects to this. First, we are at a crossroads when it comes to the judiciary in this country. What the conservative movement has tried to do with the judiciary is to basically end around democracy. Never mind the fact that the vast majority of people in this country want people to have the right to choose what happens to their own body. They've realized that if they can pack the courts with ideologically opposed judges, they can basically have their way. And that is a real challenge because what's happening now is you're getting younger and younger less and less credible appointments because, of course, they're lifetime appointments. Now, you got to wonder whether or not that makes sense in a world where people are living like 20 years longer than they did back when those decisions about lifetime appointments were made. And this would be a great time to offer a message from our sponsors, the Marguerite Casey Foundation. The recent upsurge in book bans is a stark reminder that the ideas and stories found in books have the power to help us reimagine a better world and change everything. Why else would right-wing forces be trying so hard to ban them? Our sponsor, Marguerite Casey Foundation, has a book club to help refuel your freedom dreams. The MCF book club, Reading for a Liberated Future, features the ideas of leaders who encourage us to reimagine how we can radically transform our democracy, economy, and society. Together, their series of more than a dozen book club events offers a course toward a liberated future. Sign up for the MCF book club and check out the recent event in honor of the newly released book, Let This Radicalize You, Organizing and the Revolution of Reciprocal Care at caseygrants.org book dash club. But there's a bigger challenge here. How swayed can members of the judiciary be by their friends and pals who may or may not have business before the court? We've seen these issues when it comes to, most egregiously, Justice Clarence Thomas's dealings with a billionaire who ended up 
paying for charter flights for him and paying for one of his family members' private schooling. But he's not the only Supreme Court justice who's enjoying, I don't know, billionaire-funded flights. The other one is Samuel Alito, the guy who wrote the decision in the Dobbs case ending Roe v. Wade. But all of that should force the question, how much power over our society, over our bodies, do we want to give to a group of unelected jurists? And I think they're making the case as to why that's pretty dangerous to begin with. But there's a second bigger question too, which is to say, what role does science play in all of this decision making? When one federal court judge can potentially take away access to a safe, effective medication that's been used for 23 years, despite the fact that the federal agency whose job it is to approve that based on rigorous evidence and science has said it's safe, what power do we want to give one person, any one person, the ability to make those decisions, to remand the scientific process? And that's part of what we're trying to do here, is that science doesn't always speak for itself. And unfortunately, scientists don't always speak so well for science. But it's critically important. Shouldn't science dictate what medications are available, what safety and efficacy means, what people can have access to? And then if it is safe and effective, shouldn't individuals themselves be able to make their own decisions about whether or not they want to access those medications without somebody telling them that they have to go visit a doctor or they can't get them in the mail? These are decisions that we are now allowing a certain precedent about who can and can't remand whole bodies of scientific evidence when it comes to public policy making and decision making by individuals who stand to benefit or lose the most from the decisions that are being made. I think it'd be really awesome if an effort was made to appoint more federal court judges with a background in science. Now, I know to be a judge, you usually have to go to law school, although it's actually not legally true. You actually don't have to be a lawyer to be a judge. That's a whole different story. But it'd be awesome if we picked more people who had backgrounds in science so that, well, when they're making decisions where science is relevant, they can actually read and engage the science with some degree of legibility. Now, look, we haven't heard from the Supreme Court yet, and access to mifepristone hangs in the balance. But it's also the basic precedent about whether or not science can be remanded by ideology. And that is a really dangerous precedent.